are right there. Look at that safe water bottle wrap. <laughs> you have got um, yellow water. It's yellow water. Yeah. And this is Freightonomics. Freightonomics. I'm Zach Strickland, and this is Anthony Smith. And we are here to discuss the connection between the macroeconomic environment as well as the freight market. And what a freight market macroeconomic environment it is, Anthony Smith. It is one indeed. <laughs> it is one indeed. It is one, uh, one crazy world that we live in. And so we are now uh, approaching... 4th of July. Now, 4th of July signifies traditionally in the freight market uh, summer peak season. Uh, for any freight broker out there, they're going to know exactly what this means. Maybe not necessarily for the shippers uh, or some of the carriers out there, depending on the commodity they ship. But traditionally speaking, we see a surge of freight volume in June, uh, capacity reduction approaching the 4th uh, July holiday. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of people take July is the second most vacationed time of year next to what, Anthony Smith? Christmas? Exactly. Christmas yeah. Christmas to New Year's. Uh, one of the single most uh, non-productive weeks of the year. Uh, also one of the most uh, frequently vacationed times of year. So a lot of loss of production there, but not really. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, we are, we are, you know, this, this year's a little different in the way that we are, we're seeing freight volumes explode. Uh, we're seeing, you know, we are obviously in this COVID, post-COVID world where, you know, we're not really sure what's seasonal, what's not seasonal. Are we recovering? Are we not recovering? Is this a false positive? Is this something that's sustainable, et cetera? We're going to discuss that on today's show. Um, and, you know, something else we're going to discuss. We have a couple of pretty hot button items here, and they're a little saucy. Anthony, <laughs> saucy. I use that when I when I talk about things that are a little bit, you know, touchy to talk about. Okay. Um, especially when it involves, you know, government policy and uh, and you know certain interactions. You know that you could, uh, you know, I like you. Obviously, anybody that's listened to the show or watched the show knows that we don't really like to delve into the political arena too much. But inevitably, our subject matter has to touch on it at times, uh, trying to present it as objectively as possible without leaning one side or the other. But you know what? No. Oh, you're no. Gonna... I registered to vote yesterday. See? And guess what? I registered my same party every year, apolitical, <laughs> not party. I am right in the middle. Yeah, I just want to hear everything. But I, yeah, I saucy. do not agree let's, nor let's disagree with you. I mean, I want to hear all perspectives, and that's yeah. what this is, all perspectives. Let's hear about it. Let's hear about it. So let's Make dive into these, decision. these stories of the day, as we call them. So the first story that I have is this is, this is a very sensitive topic, like I mentioned, uh, the insurance requirement uh, in the, uh, the trucking industry. So basically, there's a bill moving in the House of Representatives that basically states that now trucking companies or registered entities that are trucking companies now have to have $2 million of insurance versus the $750,000 of insurance, increasing that insurance cost significantly, especially uh, as a proportion of revenue for the smaller carriers. Um, <clears throat> this is, is already low though, right? So, yeah, <laughs> they're already really low. So normally, you know, looking at some of our data, uh, depending on what size carrier you are, it, you know, on average accounts for roughly 3 to 6% of your total uh, revenue in general. Again, that fluctuates wildly. We can have some people that, it, you know, if you had a huge claim or you have a huge amount of reserves sitting in your, in your coffers, that can be a lot more or significantly less, depending on how you're uh, approaching the way that you manage that uh, risk assessment side of your business. But uh, this bill uh, does get a lot of attention from some, uh, the smaller carriers. OIDA has come out and stated that they do not approve of this bill anymore. It's part of a larger amendment or a larger bill uh, that's moving through that has a lot of other stuff on it. I'm not going to dive into that, but this is this is one that basically uh, OIDA, uh, the owner operator. Independent Owner Operator Association, the lobbying entity that represents a lot of the small fleets, small truckload uh, carriers in the United States. Um, you know, they basically say that this is, you know, Todd Spencer is the president and CEO. He says this, what this proposal will do is destroy small trucking businesses in every corner of the country. Now, whether or not you agree with that is, is, is up to you, but 
uh, you know, from his side of the coin, you know, the, the way they're presenting this bill is basically saying this increased level of insurance liability coverage is going to promote safety. I'm going to go ahead and agree with the fact that it does not promote safety. <laughs> you fail to accept. Yeah, that's 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 a flawed argument just by itself. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense that, you know, I, just because I get increased homeowners insurance coverage does not make me a safer homeowner. Doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to stop tornadoes from coming through Chattanooga. Um, it does not also, if I'm you know, do you want to pay more for your car insurance? Does that make you more of a, the safer driver? Uh, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Actually, the chances are that you are actually less of a safe driver if you have higher insurance costs, <laughs> just because that's based on statistics and the way your your behavior. Uh, this is not necessarily, you know, and th there's other parts of this that I'm I'm kind of not addressing right now, but as a pure, uh, you know, measure of argument for safety, I think that they have an argument here that it is not a pure safety concern. Uh, you know, you have, you're, you're basically saying to a lot of these owner ops, hey, you can't afford to be a truck driver because of these insurance costs. Now, you know, it, it's, it's, to me, this looks more like a lobbying measure to kind of increase barriers to entry, which again, indirectly, may create a safer environment. But anybody that's been in this industry long enough knows that a lot of the owner operators are actually some of the safest drivers out there. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the whole idea that in this one aspect of insurance cost is going to promote safety is, is, is not necessarily uh, something that I buy into. But a lot of these larger fleets, they have schools. You know, the old joke in the industry and, you know, it's, it is an old joke. Uh, Swift has oh kind boy. of been, yeah, Swift has kind of been the brunt of uh, numerous memes on the internet because of their young driver population. They bring them in and, you know, you'll see the meme on there with some sort of trailer that's stuck under a bridge or something like that. And it's got Swift on it, et yeah. cetera. And, and so the idea there is that they bring in a lot of these people right out of, uh, you know, school, uh, ready to, to get on it. And they're not necessarily the safest of drivers right away, as most people are not. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they can afford higher, higher levels of insurance, therefore bringing in a lot more of these younger drivers, which aren't necessarily safe. But how do you yeah. get to be an older driver? But you have to start out as a younger driver. So I'm not necessarily saying it's the wrong way to do it. I'm just basically stating that this in increasing insurance cost is not necessarily the right way to promote safety. Do you agree? Disagree? Yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds that way. And we have, I forgot to mention, we are actually live right now on LinkedIn and I believe Facebook. But right now mm -hmm. I'm looking at LinkedIn. So we have some comments coming in. Yeah, Zach, I imagine we course. do. <laughs> uh, we have Dooner Dooner, of course, asking about my craft singles on my water bottle. I mean, product placement at its <laughs> finest. But um, we have Nerfad. Uh, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. Nerfad. Nada Revic. Not a Revic. Nerfat, not a Revic. Um, he says, since increase, I will now be charging. He's a, okay, since increase, I will be, now be charging a minimum of $5 per mile as a carrier to cover my regulatory cost. Thank See? you kindly. That's, the that's will now be over $100 per hour starting after the 60 minutes instead of $50 per hour after the two hours. It does not promote safety whatsoever. Just because I pay higher for home insurance, it doesn't mean my <laughs> house is less prone to on fire or exactly. be swept away by a hurricane. Um, John Calloway um, says they should tackle driver prerequisites if they want a safer, safer driving on the roads. Owner operators have probably been on the road longer than anyone else. Typically, that's that's just to jump in on that. Owner operators typically come from trucking companies, so they've been trained by a Night Swift or mm -hmm. somebody like that. And then after a while, they save up enough money, decide this is what they want to do. They start they they go into a smaller fleet, then they go into an owner operator setting, having lots of experience on the road and traditionally being some of the safer drivers out there. So yes, that yeah. is that is a that's traditionally the flow for anybody not familiar with you know how truck drivers kind of progress throughout their their careers. Some of them will stay on with the larger fleets, of course, uh, but 
uh, a lot of those owner operators have been around for a long time. You don't just come right out of school and go, I'm ready to go hop in a truck. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not so much because you got to have enough money to c go into this industry uh, to purchase that truck, et cetera. So yeah, uh, this, this appears to be a way to kind of, you know, increase a barrier to entry. It's very large fleet centric uh, in legislation. Um, so again, it may actually over, and of course it's going to inflate rates. It has to. Um, it's going to inflate those smaller carrier rates that we just heard about, and it's also going to put some upward pressure because it's going to reduce capacity in the market. Yeah. And whether or not you think that's good or bad, it obviously depends on your position in this market. Perspective. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it looks like uh, Nerfide is filling it. He's over here Rick flaring. You're really missing out if you're not looking at these comments right now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it seems like a lot of people are, are agreeing in uh, the comments here and that this is not this is not an efficiency thing. This is not a safety thing. Call it what it is. I, I yeah. you know, you, you can say it's it's safety, but that's that's not really what this is. And you know, we have to call it out for what it is. And it's it's a measure to try to really, uh, you know, reduce competition. Is 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 the way I see it. Yeah. And we have. Oh man, Zach, they yeah. are <laughs> testing me today yeah. with these names pronunciations. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> my apologies, but. <laughs> Ankit Apadadhye mm -hmm. says, would this mean higher freight charges and based against small and biased against small carriers, or would it mean lower margins for carriers all along? Again, ba biased against uh, small carriers. It's definitely going to be biased against the smaller carriers because as a percentage of revenue, it's going to have a much higher cost burden to them because they don't have the amount of revenue that these larger carriers have. And I mean... You know, maybe there's an argument out there that states the the opposite. I'm very welcome to hearing that. Uh, but on the surface, this really looks like it is not a safety thing. It is, it, it's, it, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty apparent to a lot of people out there. Uh, but we could we could literally spend an entire show on this, and I don't. But I don't want to do that. I just think it's worth covering because it is looking like more and more that we are going to go this direction, which again, like I mentioned, could have a pretty significant uh, capacity uh, reduction. Uh, you know, end result, as well as an increased rate pressure here in the long run. So this is, you know, we're obviously in the middle of a very volatile time, but this is one of those long run measures that uh, can get lost in the shuffle. And, you know, amidst all the stuff going on, you know, it's a long, it's an, it's a long game that we're all playing and you need to be aware of it uh, for how it pertains to you. Right. Uh, the next item Big story of the day, uh, Yellow Roadway, basically getting a government bailout of $700 million in return for a 30% stake. The government is going to now own 30% of YRC. This to me is, uh, I've never seen anything like it. Mm. Um, and it's and it's indicative. Again, this is because of their uh, health and welfare, their benefits. They have not been, they did not make their payments uh, during the you know, the big COVID pandemic drop in volumes. They weren't allowed, they could not make their payment to their health and welfare, their benefits to the pension fund. Um, and they were granted a waiver, uh, you know, during, you know, the, in the middle of all this, along with several other people uh, or companies that couldn't make payments on things. And now it looks like they still can't make their payments. And again, this makes sense because it's, even though volumes have recovered, the revenues, aren't all the way back. I mean, you're, you're st we're still climbing uh, out of a period of time of major depression. And, and for a trucking company to lose 20 to 30 percent or miss 20 to 30 percent in a month, it, tip it actually takes you recovering significantly more in the subsequent months to make up for it. Yeah. And we were down 20 to 30 percent for two consecutive months. It's just now the end of June, early July. There's no possible way that they make recovery uh, you know, that quickly. So they had to see that this was not going to happen once they saw the full brunt of the pandemic and volumes coming down. So now they're getting a government bailout on their pension fund so they can uh, continue to pay off the pension plan. Now, Anthony, this one to me, pension plans, they're, they're, they're outdated. They were created way back when, uh, you know, people would retire and, you know, had certain life expectancy. And there, you weren't taking, I mean, basically, 
people are living longer, you know, and not uh, they're retiring earlier. So you're going to grow this, you know, it's just like social security right now. Yeah. You have uh, this huge ballooning population of retirees and people no longer working, not contributing to these funds. And they're outnumbering the people that are currently employed. So by, you know, just by basic math, <laughs> yeah. you can see now we have more employees retired in aggregate that we're still supporting versus the people contributing. It's an imbalance because you have these population surges and swells and things like that. So pension funds in general have been eliminated across the board, except for a lot of these unionized industries. You know, yeah. and YRC, of course, is a union carrier, uh, along with uh, many of their subsidiaries, New Penn, uh, New Holland, et cetera, all, all unionized carriers. And this puts a huge, uh, you know, ball and chain around their ability to sustain because as cost burdens increase, uh, they really need they need to get more and more money. Yeah. So carriers out there that are non-union, they don't have to support this huge retirement fund of people that have been retired for the last 30 years from there. <laughs> yeah. So they have to raise their rates just to stay afloat, and then that puts them less competitive. So now they're not as competitive. So this does not make sense in the long run to have this type of setup. So eventually this will fail without any... You know, unless, again, continued support from some outside source, uh, it, it will not work in the long run. And they know it. I think most financial people understand this. Uh, so there's got to be a way to restructure this or some sort of agreement that they need to come to to really remedy this. Otherwise, the government's going to end up owning all of YRC. Um, and I don't know if the government really wants to be in the business of trucking anymore. Um, and I don't even know what that looks like, honestly. But this feels... Uh, this feels like a kind of the beginning of the end yeah. <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and I think you hit on it um, with talking about some of the union areas that are more um, lean towards pensions. I mean, but we're looking at a larger demographics on pensions overall. We're looking at demographics of now and 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 employees today. We're looking at more millennials in the workforce. Not a lot of folks are staying long enough to even kind of make good on some of those pension plans. If, if you're pitching that to someone mm -hmm. that's fresh out of college that they have a pension, like whatever, that doesn't sell me at all. And so that's a whole nother aspect. Um, Tim Duner point. here asked, Anthony, how many carriers are government owned like that? Um, I, I, I can kind of lean that one to you, but I think that's probably more of a international thing, right? There's probably more international yeah, there's, government. There's not, I don't, I don't know of any government owned carriers in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> that's I can probably think maybe more yeah. government centric entities and in yeah, overseas or something like that, uh, for or sure. maybe airline carriers or something like that. But I can't think of anything freight related. Th this is unprecedented to me. I've never, I don't, you know, and again, I haven't researched it extensively, so please feel free to point out where I'm, I'm missing something. But most of the entities that I know of are either private, privately funded or publicly funded, you know, yeah. via the, you know, the stock market. But it is, you know, to me, this is a sign that YRC may be on the way out here in the next couple of years, uh, again, depending on some sort of outside influence. Um, and YRC, of course, one of the largest LTL carriers in the United States. They were the probably one of the most premier LTL carriers back in the 90s. Uh, you know, our resident Mike Vincent actually worked at Roadway uh, before the merger, and it was a very well-run company at, at that point in time. It was very uh, streamlined and, and, and efficient, uh, and but it was it was an aggressive environment to work in. That's for sure, yeah. according to him. Um, but yeah, this this looks this looks rough for YRC. Again, I don't know if that's going to have you know any of those LTL cares out there might be ready to uh, you know pounce on some of this. Uh, extra stuff, but I mean, if YRC is going to have to start raising its rates, or maybe if they're getting subsidized by the government, they can lower their rates. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're getting more comments in here. Uh, like I said, this was going to be a saucy. Oh yeah, couple you of topics. It. I was interested. I'm like, okay, what do you mean by the sauce? Let's hear. It. Let's get it. <laughs> um, Sergio Martinez says, "Fund the unions." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no. That's this way of doing business for truckers is not profitable, so we need to demand our local politicians to fix the scam. Sergio Martinez making his opinion known. Yeah. No, and, and there's certainly going to be a lot of people out there that have that view uh, in terms of, you know, the government bailing out, uh, you know, this is a union fund, uh, and the only reason it does still exist is because of the union. Uh, so 
there's there's logic there. Yeah. Um, view it how you want to. It upsets a lot of people, but at the same time, it's the government's bailing out a lot of things right now. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and they're bailing out a lot of people individually. So again, I'm not I'm not going to dive too deeply into that. I think everybody has their certain viewpoint on it, um, and we just stated what happened <laughs> yeah. in that regard. But we've got to get into what the freight market's doing right now, Anthony Smith. Uh, you know, we talk about it just about every day on Freight Waves now. Uh, but this has been a very strange couple of weeks in the freight market. Volumes are now 24% up year over year. Uh, huh. Yeah. <laughs> They're up somehow, some way. This has to not be sustainable. I mean, by just basic physics. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would have to think that this is not something that's sustainable. Um, over a long period of time, obviously, but they continue to rise as we approach July 4th. This is not a mechanism that normally happens as you approach the holiday. It typically starts to taper, Yeah. but we are not living in normal times. Um, you know, I guess the big question that on, is on everybody's mind is, is this sustainable or not? And what is, what is propelling it? But I'm going to lean on you to give us the macroeconomic indicators that, you know, what... If you were to look at this from a macroeconomic standpoint, is this a sustainable uh, thing? Um, so I, I always break it down into two segments, of course, consumer and industry. On the consumer side, there are quite a few headwinds right now. So what we're seeing is the consumer confidence is, is just, it, it was dipping throughout the quarter, but it just hit a three month high. So consumers are feeling confident again. And I think a lot of the drive that we're seeing right now is gonna be backed by that consumer activity. Um, we're seeing consumer spending starting to go up despite some uh, 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 income coming down after we know we got that one-time check. That doesn't was, make sense. That $1,200 <laughs> check that came through. Um, savings rates is still high right now relatively to historic trends. Um, so I think from that consumer standpoint, although the confidence is increasing, it's not very sustainable because we have a lot of Americans that are now making more on these unemployment benefits than they were pre COVID-19, so that's going to be a, a headwind potentially in the coming months if those benefits aren't extended. Another major headwind, Zach, I, I know you've probably seen this because you're glued to the TV screen all the time. You're always watching the news <laughs> and seeing what's going on in all the different networks around the world. Um, but there are many states throughout the country, Florida, um, Texas, Arizona, um, starting to reel back their reopenings and starting to actually reinstate some of the uh, things that they kind of loosened up on. So um, I think bars, gyms, and uh, I, th I forgot what else. I know restaurants are still open in Arizona, but I know for mm -hmm. sure bars and gyms are now closed. Um, states that were reopening, kind of slowing things down because we're starting to see more spikes and more cases. And so that is also going to take away from not only um, that, 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 that feeling of people going out and kind of getting active again, but also going to kind of take away from those people that were back into uh, employee positions. Working for maybe a few weeks, hey, not so quick, we're going to peel things back again. So that's going to be a uh, play a factor onto uh, the amount of consumer activity. But we did see that um, uh, jobless claims are coming down. We're going to get more jobless claim numbers tomorrow, of course. Um, this is going to be something that we're going to be watching closely because it hasn't been decreasing at the pace that people really expected. Um, retail sales, one that popped up double digit growth month to month basis, of course, is not going to be even across the board. Um, when we're looking at that uh, segment, when we're looking at retail sales, of course, uh, I think grocery stores are still very much high. Um, online e-commerce, that's going to be a, a game changer. I think that's going to be one that's going to really be ushered in as a sticking point because it's kind of the way things are going, despite department stores kind of um, finding some ground there. You know, you can probably go to some local malls that were reopened. I'm sure you're seeing a little bit more foot traffic, but not enough to like really sustain anything long term. Um, when we're looking across the board at that, housing starts definitely bumped up slightly after hitting a pandemic low in April. Um, permits showing signs that there's some life coming up in uh, the coming months here. Double digit growth, I think it was 14 something percent on a month to month basis, still below the year ago level, but up, upward moving. Um, so there are signs of life, but overall, what's gonna dictate the, the, the trajectory of the recovery is going to be the course of how COVID-19 is handled. And it's, it's always what it's gonna come back to. Um, 
whether or not the economy opens up, some would say too quickly, and risk kind of derailing everything that's kind of been in the works here, or if things are opened up too slowly, or if things are opened up and if we're not just seeing that bump, I think the consumers are ready. It's just gonna be the course that the virus takes. Is there gonna be a vaccine soon enough? Is there gonna be a way to really implement um, better social distancing or, or however it might be um, strate uh, strategized around kind of operating around this virus? On the industrial side, we had uh, ISM PMI numbers came out. I'm going to dive into that a little bit more uh, tomorrow. Um, but just early readings, we saw that the PMI number uh, bumped up to 52.6. That's a 9.5 point uh, gain. A lot of points so there. So we're back to expansion. Back to expansion after a few That's months huge. of contraction. And uh, new orders had a 24.6 point gain um, now at 56.4. So new orders indicative of future production. That's another um, huge activity. One. And so when we're looking at uh, industrial production is also lagging and lagging. So we're going to kind of wait to see what those numbers are. But we're seeing early on the survey uh, diffusion based indexes are showing that there's an increase for manufacturing. And that's going to be huge for flatbed operators and that equipment type. Um, as And, and I, I have high hopes for potentially construction, which is also going to be meaningful for uh, flatbed as well. Um, but for, for the rest, um, drive-in, reefer, I think that's also going to come back down again to the consumer. Consumer seems to be willing and ready. It's going to come down to a confidence thing, of course, um, a stability thing. Those feelings. Um, <laughs> I have to get confidence in there somewhere <laughs> at some point. And um, that's really where it's going to come down to. Uh, again, we're going to watch closely for those jobless claim numbers that come out tomorrow morning. Um, unemployment also comes out tomorrow morning, so we're kind of getting an overarching view on that as well. Uh, but there's a lot to look at, and um, a lot right now is saying that there's a ton of headwinds depending on if other states follow suit mm -hmm. on rolling back uh, that reopening. So I, I think some of these headwinds are not really headwinds in the way that a lot of people are adapting mm -hmm. to this live-at-home lifestyle. Okay, they're not going to the bar, but they're ordering online electronics. They're yeah. ordering furniture online. They're going to Home Depot and Lowe's anyway. So there's, projects. you're not stopping them going there. So depending on your view there, uh, but they're spending their money in other places. They're saving more, but they're also spending it differently. Yeah. So some of these more traditional indicators may not be as connected as they once were in my mind. So. Uh, you know, whereas I do think that it is very valuable to hear about unemployment, uh, for sure, uh, until those benefits run out, uh, until some of these, I think we have yet to see the real brunt of what has happened over the last few months in terms of the true downside. Um, and I think that that's going to be a very wavy, uneven process uh, in that. So I do think that there's definite headwinds out there on the macroeconomic side, but in the meantime, we are going through a restart and we are seeing change of preference in the way that, that people are behaving, which is filtering into the freight market. People are buying boats, people are buying bikes, they're buying cars again because they're not Ubering anymore. Uh, they're, all sorts of preference changes are happening right now and it's causing not just factories to start up and then have to ramp up some of this inventory, but it's causing these retailers to really shift quickly to what the consumer is asking for. Yeah. And I think that's really what we're seeing right now. And I think that it is going to keep volumes a little bit higher uh, than anticipated for the summer. Um, but I do think that we will see a buckle at some point in that process, whether or not it's driven by inventory depletion mm -hmm. or the consumer all of a sudden doesn't have a check coming in or f accidentally spent too much yeah. and now has to pay their credit card bill. Yeah. And you think of consumers <laughs> on the other side of the spectrum, mm -hmm. real quick, uh, those that aren't, like, say, in the housing market but renting, there is a lot of worry once uh, some of these evictions holds mm -hmm. come offline that they're yep. going to be on the streets. And so there's a lot. Yeah. Uh, well, from port, different perspectives. Port volumes on the inventory front, port volumes, 5 to 10% down year over year still. So yeah. eventually inventory potentially could run out. So that is pretty much, you know, all the time we have for, for digging into that. I'm going to ask you one question. Oh, Thanks, geez. everybody, for watching. What is your favorite 4th of July activity? Favorite what? 4th of July activity. I just like spending time with the family on the vineyard. It's not sticking an M80 into something and blowing no. it up? No. Oh, come no. on. Got enough of that in my Brooklyn days, all right? Come I don't on. need to hear any popping off. Ridiculous. <laughs> Have a happy fourth. <laughs> happy fourth. <laughs>